And in chapter 40, we learn that Pharaoh had two of his own personal officials, his own personal servants, and for some reason he became angry with them. One was the king's cupbearer, the one who was in charge of his wine. And the other was the baker, the one who was in charge of his bread. Maybe there was a feast. Maybe the feast didn't go well. And so Pharaoh blamed the one who was in charge of the wine and the one who was in charge of the bread. But anyway, he was so angry with them that he threw them in, in prison. And Joseph had some sort of authority over them in prison. It says in verse 4, the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them, and they were in confinement for some time. Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, this is chapter 40, verse 5, who were confined in jail, they both had a dream on the same night. Each man had a different dream. Joseph came to them in the morning and saw that they were down. Their faces were unhappy. And uh, Joseph says to them, Why are you so unhappy? Now, stop a minute and think about that. What qualifies us for ministry? What brings us to a position where we're able to minister to other people? Is it that good things always happen for us and always good things happen to us? Here's one thing I've noticed about myself. If I am sick, if I'm ill, especially if I have nausea, I think I'm going to lose my dinner. If I have that kind of feeling, it's impossible for me to be nice. Don't expect me to act like a Christian. Don't even expect me to act like a nice person. I can't. I feel bad. I'm sick. Go away. Don't bother me. Think about Joseph. Think about how much he had to be sad about. First he lost his brother's favor. Then he lost his father. He lost his country. He lost his freedom. Then he lost his master's favor. favor. And then he lost his freedom twice. First he was a slave, then he became a prisoner. Think about that. And now he sees two people who are unhappy, who are in prison with him. What does he say to them? He says, why are you unhappy? Now that's a stupid question. They're unhappy when they're in because they're in jail. They're in prison. They used to live at the palace. Now they live in the prison. So the great question is not, why are they unhappy? But Joseph, why aren't you unhappy? Why aren't you unhappy? And he's concerned about them. There are some people who are only concerned about themselves. They only think about themselves. Those people cannot minister. Those people cannot serve God because they never think about God and they never think about others. They only think about themselves. My wife and I used to have friends in another country where we used to live. These friends, they were nice people. They were interesting people. They were attractive people. But there was just one thing about them. They only talked about themselves. They wanted to talk about themselves. They were desperate to talk about themselves. And I know this is very carnal, this is very sinful, but sometimes when I was with them, I would time them. And I would think, how long will they go before they talk about anything but themselves? They weren't interested in us. They didn't want to know anything about us. They didn't want to talk about our children. They didn't want to talk about our background. They didn't want to talk about our jobs. They didn't want to talk about God. They wanted to talk about themselves. And so I let them. I mean, it's my job to talk. I like to rest. So if you want to talk about yourself, go ahead. 
when you're done, I'll know everything you know, and you won't know anything I know. So I'm the gainer. If you want to talk about yourself, go ahead. Joseph wasn't like that. He didn't come up and say, let me tell you how unfair it is that I'm in here. I was accused of rape. Not only am I not a rapist, I'm a virtuous person. I refuse to take a woman who is trying to rape me. He doesn't say that. He says, why are you sad? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the reason you're sad. Maybe I can help you to be happy. Maybe I can do something for you. You see how amazing this man is. He's just a kid. He's just a kid. But he knows how to minister. He knows how to reach out to people. Have you ever been so burdened with your own problems that you find it impossible to reach out to somebody? Joseph had problems. He had big problems. He lost everything. So what's he doing? He's reaching out to people with problems. He's trying to help them with their problems. He notices them. He reads their face. He can see in their countenance and the expression on their face that they've got a problem. And he's concerned about that problem. He wants to talk about it. He has the heart of a pastor, the heart of a minister, the heart of a helper. This amazing hero called Joseph. No wonder the last part of the whole book of Genesis is about him. He's worthy of our study. He's somebody we need to learn about. He's somebody we need to be like because he's like Christ. He's a little picture of Christ. In the very beginning of the Old Testament, in the very first book of the Bible, we see a picture of someone who's a man of sorrows, but he's reaching out to other people in their sorrow. He says, I think your face is sad. Let's talk about it. Maybe you don't need to be sad. Tell me your story. Tell me the problem. Let me tell you something about people. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. The story of their life, the story of who they are, the story of where they came from, the story of where they are, the story of where they want to be. And you know what? It's a story worth hearing. So when you're with somebody, don't be so eager to tell your story. That's great. I hope you do get to tell your story. And I, and I hope it's a good experience. But maybe that's not the most important thing. Maybe the most important thing is for you to hear their story, for you to listen to them. That's the kind of person Joseph is. Joseph has a real, real interesting story to tell. A real interesting story, even though it's a sad story. But he wants to hear their sad story because they have sad faces and he's concerned about them. So in verse 7, he says, why are your faces so sad today? He notices them every day. And he notices that there's a difference between today and yesterday. They say to him, verse 8, we have had a dream and there's no one to interpret it. Now, what do you do when you're Joseph? Where had the interpretation of dreams gotten Joseph? The interpretation of dreams made him a slave in Egypt. And now he's not only a slave in Egypt, he is an imprisoned slave in Egypt. So when Joseph went into the business of interpreting dreams back at home, it didn't do him any good. It got him into a lot of trouble. So if you're Joseph and somebody says, well, you know, I've had a dream and I don't know what it means, what do you say? Do you say, oh, no, I'm not your guy. I'm finished with dreams. Dreams have gotten me nothing but trouble, and I'm not going to make that mistake again. Is that what Joseph says? Oh. 
He says, you know what? The interpretation of dreams belongs to God. Belongs to God. What good ever came to him honoring God? He tried to honor God by interpreting the dream that God gave him. He tried to honor God by holding to God's law and God's morality when a married woman tried to take him to bed. He honored God. What happened when he honored God? He was punished for it. He became a prisoner for it. So now what happens when these men have dreams in, in prison? He says, let's honor God. Let's give all honor and credit and glory to God. God knows what dreams mean. To God, we owe the interpretation of dreams. Please tell me about it. Amazing. Amazing. What kind of man is this? Where do we find men like that? Where do we find women like that? These are what men are like. These are what women are like when God is with them and God is with Joseph. So, they tell him the dream. Uh, first, the chief cupbearer tells his dream. He says in verse 9, There was a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches, and as it was budding, the blossoms came out, and the clusters produced ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes, and I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, Joseph knew the meaning of the dream immediately. Immediately. Listening to a dream for Joseph was like listening to a foreign language that you understand and nobody else understands it. He didn't have to go to the dictionary. He didn't have to go to the internet. He didn't have to think a while. He didn't have to pray a while. He knew it immediately because God had given, given him a great gift, the gift of interpreting dreams, just like some people have a gift of interpreting languages. This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three days, within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. But please don't forget me when this happens. Please do a kindness for me when the dream comes true and try to get me out of here. That's what Joseph says. For in fact, I do have a story to tell too. I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And I've really not done anything to deserve being in this prison. But here I am anyway. Verse 16, when the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream and in my dream there were three baskets of white bread on my head. In the top basket there was some there was some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Then Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree and the birds will eat your flesh. Wow, that's hard. Then it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now, 
we think that Joseph was in prison about two years. Here's the question. How long does God get? How long does God get with you? How much time do you give God to do what you want Him to do? Do you give Him a day or a week or a month? Do you give Him a year? Do you only give Him two years? What does it mean to give God your heart? What does it mean to give God your life? What, what does it mean to give your heart to Christ? I think it means that you trust Him forever. You trust Him in time. You trust Him in eternity. By the way, why should we be, why should we be surprised if hard things happen to us? You don't think hard things happen to Abraham? You don't think hard things happen to Isaac? You don't think hard things happen to Jacob? You don't think hard things happen to Joseph? You don't think hard things happen to Moses, to David? You don't think hard things happen to the Lord Jesus? Why are we so surprised? Why are we so shocked? If God was worthy of their trust, He's also worthy of our trust. Remember, He will write the last chapter because He's author of the play, the play of your life. He's going to finish the book the book of your life. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.